Hey, welcome to my basement. I've got an awesome show for you guys today with two guys that I am huge fans of. I've got John Linneman from Digital Foundry and DF Retro, and I've got Joe Redifer from GameSack. And you guys know we've included some of their videos and some of the EP content this year. And this is the first time I've met either one of these guys, and I'm such a huge fan of both of them. And so the first thing I want to say to both of you is thank you so much for, uh, you know, just getting a DM from from me and responding with vi awesome video content that I've been really happy to put into our stuff. You guys rock. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, listen, I, I've been, you know, covering games for a long time in a bunch of different ways, but this has been the last couple of years I've really been digging into the retro stuff. Um, and I don't know what it was. I think it was the analog Super NT announcement, and I went, oh, yeah, I have all these Super Nintendo cartridges. I really should play some of these again. But you guys have been digging into retro for a long time, especially, I think, you, Joe. Why don't we start with you? How, how did you kind of find retro gaming to be the, your specialization? Well, I never really left retro gaming, I guess you could say. I've always kept up with the modern systems, but I've always kept my Genesis and Saturn, especially, you know, those systems hooked up. And I've just always been kind of, you know, if I see something out and about while I'm looking for m more modern games, I would just pick it up for the Genesis or, or what have you. And um, so I, I've just always been playing those games since the 90s. And you started to create content around it and it started to pick up steam right away. Right. Well, not right away, but soon <laughs> enough. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, we my friend Dave and I, you know, we both still really loved retro games. We go around, you know, to thrift stores to see if uh, they have games that we could get. And we do that like almost every week. And so we figured, you know, with YouTube, might as well make a show about it. And so we started a show and then uh, I think Screw Attack shared one of our videos, the TurboGrafx-16 one, and that's where it kind of started taking off. That's awesome. Now, uh, John, your background also I at Digital Foundry is to kind of cover the brand new stuff on a regular basis, and you really go deep dive into all of the technical sort of uh, uh, reference information out there. You really have become this reference source for <laughs> Digital Foundry for covering, you know, all of these uh, technological innovations that the video game industry is is famous for. But a big part of your beat is also digging into uh, retro stuff. Why is that side of gaming important to you? So actually, I kind of followed in Joe's trajectory there where like I never really stopped playing classic games. Like when I go back to all my old photos of my various setups through the year, I always have my Saturn hooked up, always have a Genesis hooked up, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So I just been collecting and playing for these systems. And a lot of the games I have in my collection were games I bought like at the time when they were new. Yeah. And then I've just been adding on since. But I joined Digital Foundry in 2013, so when I moved to Europe. And yeah, for the first two or three years, I guess it was like the first three years, I mean, it was just all modern stuff. But I was pestering my boss, Richard, who's been in the industry since like 1990. Yeah. Uh, like, I want to go back and revisit retro games. I want to do something on this. And he's like, no, no, no. Can't make any money doing that. Like, nobody cares. It's like, people <laughs> care. People care. And, and it's like... I actually pointed to stuff like GameSack, actually, as like an example of, look, this is good content. People do care about this. And I was like, I I'm just going to throw something together. And he's like, all right, go for it. So I did a few videos and they did well enough where it was like, all right, let's keep going. And so from there, I just kind of kept making that stuff. But the thing is, though, is because I'm so into it, the retro videos ended up taking more time to make than the actual like normal DF videos. Yes, yes. So it's actually it's really hard to fit it into my schedule these days and I want to keep doing more of it. And I, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing to balance because obviously we got to do the modern stuff, but what I really want to do is get back to the retro. So it kind of, well, you know, it comes and goes, depends on what's going on. Yeah. I think I picked up on, um, you know, cause I'm, I'm like you, right. I, I like electric playground has been just like, let's cover everything that's new on a regular basis. And we, you know, we were just making all kinds of content about what's coming up and what's, what's out there right now. But as we've seen with these new consoles and, and, uh, the horsepower that these new machines kind of demand, the sort of triple a space is shrinking. You know, they, these companies just can't make as many massive games that are world changing. Like they used to be able to. Um, you know, in the PS3 360 era, which I think is kind of the golden age for 3D experimentation, and there was just so much content coming out. Now, I think there's space in a, a sort of a player's kind of life, and certainly I found that, 
to f go back and play some of these cartridges. And, and the contrast, I, I, you know, I don't know how you find it, John, but the contrast between playing something brand new but also playing something um, that was made by five people or something with just unbelievable imagination is is a healthy contrast to kind of carry into the discussion in 2020 and 2021. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's really interesting because you're right, you mentioned small development teams and indie games have never been bigger, I think, in the yeah. modern space, right? Yeah. There's a lot of indie developed games and a lot of these developers are very much inspired by classic titles. And because of that, I feel like a lot of people now have gotten used to this sort of retro aesthetic because of these modern games. So oh. when you actually go back to classic stuff and you introduce people to these classic games they may or may not have played before, they don't feel out of date, right? Yeah. Especially like from the 16-bit era, 8-bit era, because, you know, they're all 60 frames per second most of the time anyway. Right. Uh, and it's just really high-end pixel art, you know, Sega, Nintendo, them firing on all cylinders at the time. So I think a lot of that stuff holds up really well. But it's just fun to kind of, you know, go back and experience that type of game. And they're a lot more pick-up-and-play. Uh, and, yeah, indie games kind of follow that similar model somewhat. And it's always yeah. good to have that to sort of combine with the big AAA releases, which are pretty much designed to suck up as much of your time as possible, sometimes to their detriment. Yeah, I agree. And I, I saw some of your comments on Assassin's Creed Valhalla there. But Joe, I have to ask about uh, heading out to garage sales. Like you're building this brand <laughs> with GameSack. And I'm sure like when people see you coming, it's like, okay, let's raise the prices. Let's let's see how much we can get. <laughs> well, back when we were doing that, uh we didn't really have well we didn't have the show and then we, we we still did it while the show was running but not as much um but we weren't recognized so that was good in fact we didn't start getting recognized until i would say several years after we started doing the show at least yeah. not in real life uh the first place we got recognized were you know in places like game stores of course but never like a thrift store or a garage sale or anything like that. Do you still go out and, and, and hit up garage sale? I guess not right in the COVID years, but is that still a part of the things that you like to do is to, to go search around that not stuff? Not as much as we used to because that landscape has drastically changed. It's very hard to find things um, because, you know, everyone knows about thrift stores now and, and garage sales and they are on those things like no tomorrow. So yeah. if anything comes in, they're snapped up immediately and thrift stores often know about this too. So they raise their prices and they know what they have. Now they have people searching for this or they'll, they'll put them on their auction site. Like Goodwill has an auction site and stuff like that. So it's much, much harder, but you know, I'll look if I'm in the area of a thrift store, I'll pop in for a few minutes and see if they have something. Yeah, I mean, we're all, pl you know, players that, uh, we're not kids, the three of us, <laughs> so we, we've been around for, uh, you know, many console cycles and have got a collection, but I, I, um, I, and I talked about this when I talked about the Polymega, like, that, I love that machine, but it's really not for a person that doesn't have a library, is it? It's like, you don't get a Polymega and then, like, start collecting. J John, could, did you kind of see that this was going to become... Uh, such an expensive hobby was this something that you were you know like five ten years ago could see in the in the crystal ball and recognize that this was just going to explode like it has well it's interesting because you know it always kind of felt like once you get about two generations removed from from a system the prices would always start going up right but you're right i didn't expect it to necessarily take off the way it has and i guess you know youtube shows are partially right. blame perhaps yes <laughs> it's just like because the thing is when you're doing these videos and i'm sure joe you feel the same way sometimes it's fun to highlight cool games that people probably haven't seen it's like this is a cool game i want to share this and then all of, a, all of a sudden everybody's like oh i gotta get this game now and the prices start to creep up and you know yes. enough people do that and that's kind of the end effect uh so you know i always knew that classic stuff would start to go up in time but it has kind of accelerated in a way that I didn't expect. And I'm not really sure where it's going to end, if it's just a bubble or if it's just going to keep going. Because it really hasn't shown any signs of stopping. Yeah. True. And I would like to add that at least there are ways to play them without yes. owning the real deal now. True. So, like, if it's you important. have a flash cart, you're good to go. Um, if you want to emulate, fine. I don't care. Do it. 
Yeah. You're totally and right about that, actually. That's that's really important, I think, is like you can still experience these games in different ways. Just owning the actual thing is cool, but it's not required to play it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I feel like the, the, the video game industry has been really lax on recognizing its, its ongoing value, you know, and really, you know, coming up with the mechanisms and the plans for people's desire to play these things in advance of you know rom sites you know like i really feel like there should have been a real concerted effort maybe and and maybe that's something like the idsa and esa should you know be rallying all of the publishers around is like you know we we recognize that there have been lots of ways that companies have been able to resell us things but I don't know, man. I, I feel like the demand to play a lot of this archival stuff is still very strong out there, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be having to jump through hoops or, or sort of be gray area stuff in order to play these things. Yeah, you know, what do you guys think of, of the mini consoles? Have you been uh, fans of those? Let's start with you, Joe. Uh, I mean, I, I'm happy that they exist because they give people a way to play games that they may not otherwise have had, like Earthbound on the Super Nintendo Mini. Um, yeah, a lot of people didn't have access to Earthbound because although it's not a rare game, it is hard to come by because people like it and they they want it in their collection. Um, so, but now anyone who has a Super Nintendo Mini can play it, and it's you know there's no gray area involved. It's direct from Nintendo, so I think that's a good thing. I just wish they would have made more Super Nintendo Minis. Or have them open so that you can, you know, I, I guess purchase or or whatever, get lots of other, a lot of, lots of other games on there. John, what are your thoughts on those things? Um, I think they're neat little tchotchkes, basically. Like they're fun yeah. to collect. You know, they look cool on the shelf. Um, and you know, and this is just for me. Like they're interesting devices, but they have their own flaws. Like you know, there is some extra latency there, and the scaling is not always perfect. But I think for the average customer, it's actually a pretty good way to revisit it and you know like joe mentioned earthbound that's a big one but you know something like the turbo graphics uh being brought back in a mini console like that's a system a lot of people haven't experienced yeah i hadn't ever played had really one of those library yeah, yeah exactly it was, it's it's an yeah. awesome system especially with all those japanese games on there so making that available in the u.s in an official way that's just sort of easy to pick up and play i mean that's really cool so i, I like that kind of stuff Awesome. Let's go back in your history a little bit, guys, because I, I really don't know, you know, I didn't run into you guys at E3s and things like that over the years. I've really kind of connected to you through Twitter and through YouTube. Uh, but uh, Joe, where did you, you know, what, what brought you into the game industry? Where, where, did, where did you get your start? Like, how did, how did you know that this was going to be a path for you? Wow. Well, I didn't know it was ever going to be a path <laughs> for me, but, you know, I've been playing games since you know, early arcades, you know, Miss Pac-Man and Kangaroo and Cubert were my favorites way, way, way back in the day. And, um, you know, I played a little bit of, of Friends, Atari 2600, and I finally got my own video game system. My first system was a Sega Master System. Oh. And that's when I was just like, okay, I, I, I like this stuff. I'm going to be playing it forever. I was just so hyped. At, you know, before the Genesis was coming out, I needed every little bit of information for every last game coming out for it. And then I just kind of stuck with that industry and then, you know, making videos about it just seemed natural. So because my friend Dave and I, we like to make videos in general and uh, my trade, you know, by profession, I'm a uh, video editor. So it just felt natural. That's awesome. I noticed the production value on the GameSack videos have, have been consistently good and you just keep improving and adding all kinds of great stuff. Uh, was that something that was really important to you right from the beginning was to make this uh, retro content, but, but uh, you know, make it slick, like make it really like TV ready kind of? Well, kind of um, like the first few episodes, I was just like, yeah, you know, just put a, a modicum if that's how I pronounce it. I don't know how you pronounce that word, modicum, but uh, just a little <laughs> bit of effort into it, and uh, but yeah. not too much, and see where it goes. And um, it wasn't until like uh, a few, like the sixth episode where I actually spent a lot of time editing it. And uh, after that, it just, there was no holding back because, you know, I didn't want to do anything less quality than something I had done before. Well, it, uh, the proof is in the pudding, man. It's excellent work. John, uh, let's talk a little bit about your background. I mean, you're you're based in, in uh, Europe, for folks that don't know, but uh, t talk about your winding path. How did you get into the games industry? I mean, yeah, so 
I've also been playing games for a very long time, collecting, playing, you know, just goes back to, I guess, the 80s. Um, but I did computer science in college, so, uh, and economics, weirdly enough. And so I actually worked doing IT stuff for a long time. Yeah. Uh, up until 2013. So in the automotive industry. So I did a lot of programming there, database management, uh, networking, some help desk, all that stuff. Uh, but basically at some point my wife's like, uh, let's go back to Europe because that's where she's from. She's from France and her job, she's a chemical engineer, took her back here and I followed. So I got to quit my job in the U S that just happened to coincide with my boss, Richard, basically looking for help on digital foundry. And since I had read the, the site and really enjoyed the content, I just kind of applied to it and he basically gave me a test like, uh, so crisis three just came out. It's like, just share your, just do something on it basically. So I did and got in that way. And we kind of started from there and first two years, it was all just articles mainly, but in 2015, you know, you always, you always see people joke about make the move to video, right? Yeah. Yeah. I really yeah. had to try cause you know, that's where it was going. And I had never done video editing before, but I was really like, I really, it looked exciting to me and I liked this kind of stuff. I was really into design and everything. Um, and so I just kind of started putting together some videos on my own channel and then did a few like test ones for DF. And it was like, oh yeah, actually this works pretty well. Yeah. And we, we really just completely switched over to that. And then from there, you know, the channel just kind of took off and started meeting more developers and going out to all the trade shows and just kind of like digging in from there. And uh, now we're over a million subscribers, I guess, which I did not think we would get there when we first started, but <laughs> it has happened. But I have to say, um, uh, the production values on GameSack, very inspirational for me. Because like, Thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I saw the stuff you're doing and I'm just like, like, I wanted to get to somewhere near that level at some point. And I still haven't matched a lot of those shots because you got some amazing shots in there. Yeah, uh, but it's 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 really it's it's inspirational stuff. And you know, shows like GameSec, My Life in Gaming, and some others, like you guys, really put the effort into producing really high quality like video content. And I think yeah. that's really important to drive that bar high on YouTube because there's a ton of stuff. Not to say you know people aren't doing a lot of hard work, but there's a lot of this focus on just getting stuff out super fast all the time. Yes. And a lot of times production values suffer because of this, uh, unless you have a huge team and tons of, tons of money, of course. Right. Uh, right. But yeah, for yeah. smaller creators, you know, I really think it's important to show that, like this high quality, well edited, well shot content can succeed. And it's like, you know, it kind of pushes the medium forward, I think. And that's really important. Well, and, and you guys are creating, uh, you know, through your work, kind of definitive, um, you know, mini docs almost about these products. You know, they're like... Uh, you know, they're really diving deep into the information and the data and their pertinence in, in sort of today's culture. And there's a real value that that uh, makes them evergreen as well. Like you can watch older DF retro and older GameSack videos and pull a ton out of them. And I do all the time. I have those things on, on repeat. You guys make make excellent work. Um, had you guys met before? Had you guys no, ever done it? Not, not really not in, in real person. life. Yeah. I think we just have uh, some mutual friends, but um, yeah. but yeah, not really. So that's so cool. That's it's awesome. good to finally talk, basically. So that's right. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I thought. Well, I thought this would be a lot of fun too, right? Because uh, you know we hadn't met e either, and I just think that there's. It's really hit me in the last couple of years. Like I started a segment this year called uh, Side Scrolling Superheroes, where I just look at all of these old because I have this massive collection of old Genesis and Super Nintendo games, and it's just really been it's been really fun as a like kind of a a slow down gift for me, somebody that's been so focused on the new for so long to just take a breath and go back to these titles that have been sitting on my shelf, and it's been incredibly eye opening to see. Not just the, the you know the hype value or the the sort of topical quality of how retro is big again, but the actual artistic creative value in these titles, you know. And I've also had a lot of uh, really great guests on on this podcast, like Ed Annunziata, who worked at Sega, worked on the X Men games, created Echo the Dolphin, and so like my mind has just been like, because I you know I was there when all that stuff was coming out, and I have those games. But my career path was like, go, 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 make content, make content. So it's been really cool to 
uh, make the time and have the time to kind of go back. And you guys have been... I, you're purists, though, both of you, right? Like, you both have all the original systems. How do you, how do you have them hooked up? Let's start with you, Joe. How do you... Because pl- that's why the analog systems were so exciting to me. It's like, I, I just plug in HDMI and I can play these things. But how do you, how do you play your old classic games, Joe? Well, it's... It's a conundrum now because uh, since I started the show, I just have everything like on on this rack over here and um, I swap it out as I need it. And unfortunately, I can't have everything hooked up. Somehow my life in gaming does it. I don't know. I'm jealous of how Corey does it over there. But (laughs) me, I have to if I if I need to record a Genesis game or what have you, I have to bring down my Genesis and I have to hook up the SCART cable and whatnot. I don't have a SCART switcher. I've had bad luck with SCART switchers. And uh, and then that just goes to the frame meister, which is what I use right now. And then I record that onto a uh, Elgato. 4k 60s plus onto the sd card which is pretty cool um but it's it's kind of a pain because i have to drag things back and forth and if i record modern stuff it's kind of good because i can take that elgato into the uh other room and record you know straight from the hdmi of the consoles themselves yes. uh, and it records in hdr and all that cool stuff but uh it's just as far as retro i can't have it hooked up all at once i don't even think i have the room for that are you a CRT purist? Do you have to have a, play all that stuff on a CRT, or do you are you okay with an HD TV? I mean, yes and no. I have a, a PVM right next to me where where if a system can be played on a CRT, I will do it as I record, just you know for latency reasons because I don't want to be too horrible as I'm playing the game. <laughs> so I, I want every advantage I can get as I'm recording, capturing gameplay. Um, I do have a regular. CRT with component input down in the basement, which I used to use all the time, but I don't use as much anymore because there's lack of time. But yeah, when I play retro systems, I usually like to be on a CRT if I can. Yeah. And how about you, John? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I kind of follow the same mold as Corey, I guess. We kind of talk about the setup stuff a lot where I kind of keep everything hooked up. So uh, the main way I do it is. Uh, I have a mix of G SCART switches and G Comp switches, basically, which is automatic switchers. Where you plug all your systems into these things, and they have dual output. So I'm sending one output to the to the BVM that I'm using, um, and that has two inputs. So you know the component and the RGB SCART both go to different inputs on the, the BVM. The second outputs on these switchers then come over to my setup where I have. Uh, retro tank OSSC and a frame meister kind of interchangeable in that area depending on what the content is yeah and then that goes out to my pc which goes into like a data path card so you kind of get the the raw output from there but then that is also divided up so it can also go out to my oled if i want to see it also on the big screen there so right. when everything's kind of firing and i can have it on the crt on the the large oled screen and on my pc capture all at, all at once so the idea for me for making videos is that I want to be able to say, oh, no, I need footage from this system or this game and just be able to turn around, grab the game, put it in the system and just press a few buttons. And I'm like playing it, basically. That's but I really need to have you guys come over. and test <laughs> we, we can help you for sure, dude. It's, it, it, is, it is very daunting for sure. And it is messy. Yeah. Uh, behind my setup, I have tied everything up with like these little uh, wire tie things. Uh, the thing is, though, is wire ties are awesome until they're not. And it's like, oh, I need to change this cable out. And yes. you're like, well, shoot, I got to undo is- like 10 wire ties and like <laughs> sneak it through. And- <laughs> so you really got to plan the thing out like super well, because if you don't, you're going to be like re- rerunning cables constantly. Yep. The only yeah, weird I mean, thing, that- I guess, in, in my setup, I guess, because I'm in Europe, I have a lot of uh, 60 hertz systems with right. non-European power supplies. So I have a right. huge beefy uh step down transformer that i have to use and so you know obviously systems like super nes or genesis with the external power bricks it's no problem but for internal power supplies where i don't have a european equivalent gotta run it through that so it is it gets a little bit crazy over here 
Well, you know, I, I'm thinking about this with uh, Digital Foundry and how you guys sort of break down the componentry and, and the effects that people put into their games and everything. They couldn't have picked a more appropriate person to bring onto the team. That, that computer science background is it's incredibly important for... And I think that connection, too, with the um, the way that people built, you know, classic hardware and doing that direct comparison to the way that, you know, NVIDIA is making a graphic card or whatever, that's probably really helpful for you as well, right? You can kind of see the, the through line. It is helpful, you know, since I've done a bunch of programming before and, you know, kind of have a grasp of things. I've not done any... I've done minimal graphics programming, but I've mm -hmm. studied it a lot. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm a, by no means, see, that's the thing. I'm, I'm in this weird position where I'm kind of like compared to a lot of like people just watching the content, I guess I could be an expert, but compared to the actual engineers doing the work, like I'm yes. nothing. I'm just like researching what they're doing and trying to understand it on the surface level. But as far as actually implementing it, uh, I don't, I mean, maybe eventually i could do some of it but not to that level ever well like, i think you you work as a bridge though like it and that's that's the wonderful thing about digital foundry and why that's what i'm trying to be yeah exactly i mean that... try to try to create a bridge between the developers and uh, you know the people watching the content to try to share like what's going on and what makes this interesting or cool and just try to help people appreciate the technology that goes into it and it's really, it's the same with the retro stuff. And sometimes it's actually more interesting for me because yes. I just love what developers had to do uh, to build these games for classic systems. Because, you know, back in the day, everything was so different. So when you load up, you know, I get so excited. It's like, I'll load up like an old PC Engine game and it has like tons of parallax scrolling and a friend's here. And I'm like, dude, look what they're doing on this thing. And they're just like, uh, okay, it looks like a 2D shooter. I'm like, dude, but there's, there's so many layers. And it's like, okay. It's like, like that gets me excited. So. That, that's okay. Can you put on Spider-Man again, John? <laughs> exactly. So, you know. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the, the launch of the new machines. How do you think that uh, Sony and Microsoft did um, with getting their hardware prepared and shipped and into markets? Uh, in 2020 we'll start with you john uh i think it was a huge effort i think all of them that did it they deserve a huge congratulations just for getting it to the store because i know talking to a lot of these people during the you know the work process behind the scenes it was a ton of work i mean it's always yeah. a ton of work absolutely yeah. building for launch is hard but during this year with everybody divided working from home everything's kind of scattered about the information is just not fully there and it, it, it sounds like it was remarkably difficult it's kind of amazing that it turned out as well as it did um and you know we visited microsoft back in march uh to right. see the Series X hardware for the first time and that was actually just before all the lockdowns and stuff began and we were kind of like not even sure we should go but yeah. it was like well okay we'll, we'll do this and we'll see what happens after that and then we had a ps5 trip planned as well and that got canceled. And then from there, everything just snowballed. The entire yeah. year was shot. And we were just like, is this even gonna work out? Like, I wasn't even sure this should happen. But once they actually hit, by and large, I'd say things turned out pretty well. You know, I, I kind of feel like Sony's had a slightly stronger start just because they have more like exclusive kind of new software uh, ready for the system. Uh, but I think- And that Xbox controller. Also yeah, the controller is awesome, but the Xbox yeah. is a great piece of kit as well. Yeah, uh, and the games will come, and you know, there's there's good stuff on both of them, and you know, I guess the big thing, and I've said this before, but the big thing for me is it's the first console launch in since like the PS2 era, where nearly every game is 60 frames per second or higher. Yeah. Like for years, like once the HD generation started, it was just like eh, frame rates. They just like <laughs> went, flushed down the toilet. I mean, there's always exceptions, but it was not good for a while. Well, it was like it was like the 3D generation, right? When a little 3D, bit, yeah. Yeah, it was like okay, well, everything's in 3D, and we'll we'll take 20 frames per second. That's fine. It kind of felt like that for a while. PS3, yeah. 360 era, not great in that regard overall. It got better this last gen, but uh, I think we're off to a really good start this time with the new machines. So totally I'm excited. Joe, how did, how did you uh, find the launch of these machines? Have you got both of them? Have you been playing on both of them? Uh, not yet. I have a PlayStation 5, but just 
to add on to what John was saying, I, I'm totally amazed that they even came out at all this year. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had a hard time believing that they would. Uh, right up to the launch of the uh, PlayStation 5, I think, or the Xbox, whichever one came out first, is like a couple of days difference. I was, just, I just couldn't believe that it was actually going to happen, and it did. Um, I have a PlayStation 5. I haven't gotten my Xbox yet. It's ordered through Microsoft. It'll be here someday. But I've <laughs> been enjoying the PlayStation 5 for what it is. Um, I've been going through. I actually kind of like it that I have, like, not a ton of games for it right now because I can, like, really kind of laser focus on each game and actually go through them and not just, like, get distracted. It's like, okay, I've had yes. enough of this game. Move on to this yes. one. Yes. And uh, it's just really... I kind of like that. I, I didn't think I would. You know, you always want more games, but for me right now, fewer games is working out. Especially when they're at this um, fidelity, right? And there's so much, you know, technical wizardry that's, that is that is attached to these games at this point too, right? Uh, they're bridge games as we're sort of going into whatever the real next generation is going to be. We saw Insomniac just drop uh, ray tracing into uh, Spider-Man. Um, well, it was already there at launch, but they, they added a 60 frames per second ray tracing mode. And right. Which is great. I yeah, just looked at that. And they actually managed to match the image quality of the PS4 Pro version of Spider-Man. So, you know, it looks pseudo 4K, but now yeah. it's 60 frames per second and with ray tracing. And just seeing that at launch is kind of mind-blowing. It's it's incredible, right? For for a machine that is, you know, you couldn't buy a PC at that price that would get anywhere near that, you know? And uh, it's it's remarkable how much horsepower these things have. But I feel like we're not really going to see that until next year. We're not going to really see what these things are capable of until next year, until, you know, they've pushed the, yeah, the last gen behind. But I like what you have to say, Joe, that, that uh, they're not um, inundated with so much software that it's, it's overwhelming. We've seen some console launches where it's just been like, Ugh. but this was also the first console launch that I've been a part of where there, this was the first time we got hands on with these things. You know, John got to go and visit uh, Xbox HQ and get the, the early demo stuff. But you know, the, the rest of the media out there, uh, there was no E3. There was You're no, right. there was nothing to like touch these things and see if there was anything real there. That's a really interesting point because you're right. So Back weird. in 2013, before launch, you know, we were going to the trade shows already and, mm -hmm. you know, playing PS4 and Xbox One like months before they came out and you're already kind of forming opinions there. Uh, but for this, like, we, you know, we didn't get to touch PlayStation 5 until we actually received units, which was just yes. like a week or two before launch. And it's like, it's that's never happened before where this just was so inaccessible so close to launch you're almost like is this even real is this is this really coming out uh but it did <laughs> uh, yeah i had a i had a producer at cnn uh, ask me like uh, you know two weeks before because there it took them both quite a long time to even announce pricing and announce when these things were going to come out and like just to get the basic details we didn't have those until like I think the whole world, all of us gamers are like, is is this happening? <laughs> are these things actually? I kind of gonna... feel like they were playing a game of chicken on the price, though. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, especially because the cost of the SSD stuff and everything in there, like it's pretty obvious to me. I, I don't know what the bill of materials is on these, but I'm pretty sure they're all taking quite a loss on on the hardware, selling yeah. them at the price they are to be competitive. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm sure that the one was waiting for the other to be like, "Oh yeah, we're doing 5.99," and then swoop in and be like, oh, "We're just 4.99." Uh, yeah. But you know, obviously things panned out a little differently. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the PlayStation Five uh, digital edition is probably the best value in in gaming right mm, now. You could say that, but I'm not a fan of all digital machines. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I can see it in your background right there. <laughs> Yeah, there, there was actually, I saw, some, I can't remember what YouTuber I watched, but they made a, a good comment that the, the the PlayStation with the disc, you don't have to be online in order to play a game right away. But Xbox right. Series X, you need to be online before you can play a disc-based game. Yeah, I hate this. This is something yeah. I've complained to Microsoft about it, but, you know, they're into their systems and services and everything. And yeah, it's exactly that that case. When you first get the system out of the box, you've got to connect to their servers, which 
you know, it's Microsoft. They'll probably be running for, you know, a long time out beyond our lifetime at this point, I would wager. But yeah. still, I don't like the idea that, you know, 30 years later, you might get like a brand new Series X in a box and you hook it up uh, and the server's not there or something and you can't do anything with it. It's just the paperweight. And or dude, you, you guys are... You. Yeah, What's that? that's right. Or, or the, the server, server won't let you. Exactly, exactly. So that's... They could revoke that stuff. That's the problem is like they have full control over it. Whereas on, you know, PS5, again, you just... You don't have to connect it online. And that's great. Like, that's important, I think. It is important, and it fits right alongside all of this discussion about the retro, because you guys are building content and, and connecting with millions of viewers out there related to 30-year-old machines, you know? And I don't think anybody in the game industry ever thinks about how is our game going to play 30 years from now? And they I should. think they, they should, right? They really should, and they they should think about that in their console terms, and even the uh, e even with the online accounts that they're building, you know, even these things, there should be not just a five year kind of viewpoint, but there should be a decades long kind of viewpoint around this. But I, I mean, that's easier said than done. What would you say is, um, and I'll throw this out to each of you, uh, some of the things that you wish were in either. PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series X and you were hopeful for but they didn't they didn't come in there. Well, okay, I guess I'll start um for sure. PS5, um I would say I wish it also worked with PlayStation 3, 2 and 1 games right. on the discs. Yes. Um I love the backwards compatibility on the Xbox or at least I assume I would if I had a Series X at this point, but uh yeah, I really like the Backwards compat. I've always loved backwards compatibility mm -hmm. stuff, and yeah. I think that's really important. And although I am very, very happy that it does work great with PlayStation Four games, and in some oh, cases it just like it's amazing. I just wish it kind of extended back a little further too. Awesome. What about yeah, you? John? I know you're thinking about that power base converter. Right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, for me on PlayStation 5, I know what I would like is just, I kind of wish that all of the systems right now supported Dolby Vision across the board. Right? Yeah. Uh, I know Xbox is getting updates for some games and such, but even for like, you know, if you want to use it for UHD Blu-rays and yeah, I should probably get a standalone player, but, um, you know, a lot of discs have Dolby Vision now and you can't use it on either console. And on Sony as well, if you use the UHD Blu-ray player, it doesn't seem like you actually get to use any of like the more high-end audio tracks, like no Atmos or anything like that. Um, you know, it's a small thing, I guess, but it would be nice to have full support for that standard, I think. And, you know, also PS5, variable rate refresh or variable right. refresh rate. Right. Uh, not a big deal for everybody yet. They say it's coming, uh, but it is pretty darn important, I think. Have you guys used a VRR display before? I no, not. I I have the 2016 OLED like Richard was talking about, and I and and so I haven't been. Uh, I, I've been. I want one, but you know, my wife's not going to be super. Happy I just. I only me. just upgraded to this stuff uh, in the last couple months, and you know, I, I was familiar with it, but really using it. I mean, you know, the issue like if a game's under 60 or over, you know, you get a little bit of judder and kind of it doesn't look yes. smooth. With yeah. VRR, I mean, it's completely gone. Like your eyes, it's just, it's gone. You can't visually see a difference between like 55 and 60 frames per second anymore. Like oh, it wow. just erases that problem entirely. And, you know, you'll notice when the frame rate gets lower, but it does never that, has the... Does that like affect half of Digital Foundry's content then? <laughs> when, no, when because we, we can't, when well, we can report on it, but we can't capture that. We're just showing what you get without VRR. You can right. usually assume that with VRR, it smooths out performance when it dips below the target frame rate. So, it sounds very cool. So, what did you what did you get an LG CRX or something like that? Yeah, I got, the, I got a CX uh, for my or main CX. screen, um, and then I also got a 38 inch G Sync monitor. Uh, they finally made one big enough because I was using a 38 inch ultra wide, and yeah. the large panels were always 60 hertz on the PC side, and they finally made a G Sync variant. Uh, in the last year or so so i picked one of those up so i'm all high refresh rate all vrr now uh That's but awesome. i still have my trusty crts around of course of course do you recommend that upgrade now or do you think wait for 
the next iteration of all you know of these. at this point i mean what's what's there the these you know the cx does work with the consoles perfectly so and with the latest gpu so there's no compatibility issue but we're getting so close to the end of the year and like ces yeah. and all that you know there's going to be the c11 and the next gen maybe it doesn't bring much at all but i kind of feel like if if you haven't bought in right now you may as well just wait and just wait yeah. till next spring or whenever those things hit and see what features are there and if it's not a big upgrade then look for a discounted cx uh when the c11 comes out you know that, totally. that kind of stuff so yeah, i'm yeah. waiting for the c11 myself i have a c8 now um, oh yeah i had that before and it's it's a great set but yeah it is but you can't do 120 frames per second and hdr at the same time so yep, that's kind of yep. a bummer yeah so yeah I getting 4k the... 120 and hdr it's uh it's pretty awesome yeah <laughs> I, that's crazy i have the e6 and and uh i think it's called that it was 2016 and and um I, I feel like these machines have turned it on, you know, like they're really yeah. showing on this machine, like this, t even though it's, you know, four years old, five years old, it, it's like really showing what it's capable of finally, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, especially I was playing Spider-Man Miles Morales last night for a little bit in, uh, you know, 60 frames with uh, HDR and ray tracing and it was just blowing my mind. It was just so damn good. I know this is going to be a contentious question, but I got to ask it, um, favorite console i guess we'll talk about the the retro stuff joe i think it's the genesis for you am i wrong uh not really um, I, <laughs> it's hard for me to pick a favorite but yeah the genesis the saturn the super nintendo uh the turbo graphics can't leave out the turbo graphics slash pc engine when i say like genesis i also mean the entire mega drive library and when i say turbo graphics i also mean pc engine <laughs> but basically those retro consoles are you know, eight to thirty-two bit eras. That's just my favorite. I love it. What about you, John? Dang, you pretty much stole my answer. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm going to say. Because you know, uh, I guess when it comes down to my like top, top, top favorite, it's I can't eat. It's split between Saturn and Mega Drive slash Genesis. Like I just love, I love those systems so much. Uh, I have the largest collection for those systems uh, because you know. The thing about both of them is that they're so full of games that are both amazing for pick up and play. You know, you have a short period of time, you throw in a cartridge or a disc and, you know, you have an awesome time for a short period. But there's also games with depth that you can go back and spend a lot of time in as well. But at the same time, you know, Super NES and the PC Engine, those are like similarly amazing. And also, you know, PlayStation 1, especially if you look at the Japanese library, it's really, really exceptional. And yeah, I mean, I think that that period is pretty much my favorite in terms of video games. And I would probably, I don't hate the N64, but I'd say it's kind of the odd man out. <laughs> that that was that was the machine that was uh, like right right when we started our TV show was when the uh, N64 came out, and and uh, so and that blew my freaking mind. And I I sold the show really on the strength of the fact that Sony was entering the video game industry and the PlayStation was going to like change you know side scrolling games into like these car animated sort of cartoons that we would be able to play and it and it and it did do all of that but I, I look back fondly on those but when i think back and when i've been playing again on the 16 bit stuff there was just something just really magical about it and i think it was and you guys can you know respond how you feel about this but i feel like there was a lot of learning that happened in the 8-bit era. The business kind of got revitalized again. Nintendo kind of came back and saved the business in a lot of ways. And there, were, there was a lot of money being made, a lot of really incredible uh, imagination on display in 8-bit carts. And people started to get really good at making games again. And then 16-bit gave them the horsepower to kind of realize a lot of their visions. But then what happened, I think, as we moved to 3D is that a lot of the experts in 2D didn't have a space in 3D and they had to kind of figure out what they were going to do in games where I think a lot of people left games. Um, but in that period, the teams weren't so big, the budgets weren't so high, the risks weren't so enormous that we just got this flood of incredible creativity. You know, it's funny though, you mentioned that 2D to 3D switch, but one of the reasons I love the Saturn so much is because on the Japanese side at least, 
it was the period when a lot of developers were firing on all cylinders in terms of just pumping out the best pixel art you could imagine. Cool. I mean, there's just some amazing 2D games on that platform uh, that, that hold up really well today. It's basically, you look at the Saturn 2D li library and think about like, this is the these are the kinds of things that developers were learning in arcades back in the early 90s, you know, when you had the much more powerful arcade hardware pushing all those sprites and complex graphics. It's like, well, they could apply those skills to a home console that could actually handle it. And yeah, you get that. It's just in the US, obviously, you know, the Saturn really fumbled in that sense because there was such a focus on 3D and just oh, it was huge. all yeah. this kinds of stuff. And I get it. That's where people were at the time, but we just missed out on so much. Uh, the library on Saturn really like, I think a lot of people don't really realize just how many games the Saturn has. I mean, I still sometimes run across games where I'm like, oh, I didn't even know this existed. This looks great. It, which is absurd to think that that still happens, but there's so much stuff on there. It's incredible. Do you have a, a, a top three on the on the Saturn that you think people should check out? Oh my God, it's a really <laughs> tough one. Uh, <laughs> I got to think about that for a little bit. I kind of have to look hard one. Turn, turn around and look at the question <laughs> and think about it. Um, Joe, did you stay uh, in the in the Sega Genesis or the Sega camp? Was that that the way that you came up as a player? Were you kind of like fighting with your Nintendo friends and and you then you just said, "I like Sega more"? Or, or only, did, only or in high school. Retrospect. Yeah, only in high school. But like once the Super Nintendo came out, by then I believe I was employed, so I was able to just no, no, I got that with Christmas money. But anytime, anytime after that, I, I just made sure I had all of the uh, consoles that came out, you know, except for, you know, the the really obscure ones like the Amiga CD32. I'd never had that. Oof. Yeah. Um, but I've always been a fan of owning everything because I didn't want to miss out on any games. And I still kind of have that mentality, even though there are far fewer exclusives these days. So no, I've always just enjoyed them. I was at the E3, I've been to all the E3s, and I was at the E3 where um, Apple was showing off the Pippin. And I I remember I remember Apple having a big booth, and it's like, what are they, this is crazy, this is this is nuts here. I bet so, they were right next to the, uh, the CDI and the 3DO booth. They had the CDI, I was at the, uh, guys, we, we were at, at E395, we were interviewing the Tremel brothers about um, uh, Jaguar VR. And uh, yeah, like this, they Atari had a big booth then, and they were talking about all their Jaguar plans, and it it was nuts. And we were at the Trip Hawkins 3DO, I think I guess the final big sort of real appearance of 3DO in '95. Did you get to um, use the Jaguar VR by the way? Because I got to no. I got to experience that a few years ago. I kid you not, but in Germany every year there's something called Jagfest, which is. <laughs> mm. It's it's Atari Jaguar Fest. It's you know, That's it's insane that this exists. But I was going every year <laughs> until this year, and one year somebody brought one of the only existing prototypes of the Jaguar VR. How did you find it? It's not. It's not. It's not yeah. good. They, they <laughs> should, it was, did you feel ill? It's it's interesting actually. Like the headset itself seems really pretty well made for the time. It's just that. The hardware of that era just is not suited no. to VR. The frame rate is too low. The field of view is too narrow. The screen quality is not good enough. I mean, it's just not, it's not there. It's fascinating, but it wouldn't have worked. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, this inevitable digital future that we're moving into. And, and certainly, um, uh, you know, streaming is going to be a part of it. Amazon's entering the, uh, the the battlefield now, and you know, Google's not quite letting up on Stadia stuff. They they are still rocking with stuff. Uh, you know, trying to get people to kind of pay attention to it. Facebook's entered the fray. Xbox, um, but I, there's also the the uh, you know the account based Netflix kind of model that is sort of hovering there. I think Xbox is the closest. Let's help the industry right now. As a couple of, you know, um, lifer collectors, what are some guidelines that uh, these hardware manufacturers, these digital purveyors should be following um, to keep their customers happy and to be good archivists for the medium? Why don't we start with you, John? Whew. That, 
this, this is really hard because I, I'm really not into streaming. You know, I've been pushing people towards CRTs and everything again. And all yep. of that comes down to the input experience. You know, I want to minimize input latency, reduce motion blur, reduce like all the artifacts you get. Streaming moves in the opposite direction, it which does, I guess yeah. kind of touches on one of the most important things. And I don't know how feasible it is to ever get to that point where you're like, Oh, you got like 16 milliseconds of, of latency in your game or something, you know, yeah. with streaming. Maybe it is possible. I don't know. But that, I think getting the latency down to like that type of level is absolutely critical. And even the thing is, is like modern game engines tend to be slower. And there is a push this time on the new consoles to reduce latency all around. And you're seeing developers work on this further. So there's work being done. VR also helped there because you need low latency for VR. So games have been getting more responsive again. Like I, I'm sure you've noticed this, but for a while, especially during like the initial HD era, engines were kind of inefficient in this regard. And most games had very high input latency. This yeah. is one of the reasons I think retro gaming kind of appealed a lot is because you play these games and they feel so responsive, but modern media, games at the time yeah. were yeah. very, very sluggish. Like you press a button for an action or you move the camera. It always felt, I described it as heavy, you know, uh, and streaming still kind of has this problem right now, even yes. though the industry is slowly moving towards faster and fast, faster response. So they've got to get that down. But also, like, you need, if you want this to work, I mean, the service needs to be a service you can trust, and that's hard. Like, I guess Microsoft's showing it, doing it the best right now because they go all the way back to all their 360 digital purchases are still active, right? So there is, like, this history there. Uh, but, you know, Stadia, you know, I've always kind of said, Google does not have the best track record of keeping these systems alive. You know, the yes. various experiments... Uh, what's the what are the odds that you're going to have all the Stadia games you purchased like 10 years from now? Right. Maybe they'll keep it running. They could absolutely break the trend, and I hope so. Uh, but you worry about that stuff because it, that's the thing is you don't want to feel like like you're being um, you're held hostage by the companies, right? Like mm -hmm. if you spend money and the company can just decide to turn off your access to the game, that's not great. So I think one way to get around this, and I guess it kind of breaks the whole streaming thing, is like a hybrid system. And I guess this is what xCloud is all about from Microsoft, right. where like you can own a game uh, and play it locally on your real machine, but by owning it, you also could have access to a cloud streaming version that you could use on like a mobile device. So the cloud is there just to serve uh, other purchases rather than being the key feature. I, I don't know why Google didn't do that. It's not like they like to buy like uh, you I mean, know like a massive is, is like, library. What what would you do there? It's like if you wanted to have a local game, it would have to be played on some hardware, right? Yeah. So yeah, no. Oh, right. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, right. Yeah. Microsoft has yeah. their Xboxes, so you can right, play it yes. on an Xbox. You can play it on a PC, which is maybe what Google could have done, uh, or you can stream it. And I think that is probably the best possible future for streaming for me, at least where it's like, it's a value add instead of the focus. Yes. Yes. Well, and I think the other thing that you guys both brought up is there needs to be a 30 year plan with this software yes. that not, not just a five year thing, not just the, you know, everybody has that fear of a digital service service kind of shutting off the, the service in 10 years. Everybody has that. That's a that's a very common thing. But there should be a 30 year plan because we're playing 30 year old games now quite happily. And we should feel like we can do that down the road. Joe, do you have some some guidelines or some thoughts that because uh, I'm, I'm sure and I, I'll give you this anecdote, too. I was at E3 a couple of years ago and I was talking to one of the studio producers that I know. And I said, well, why don't you guys just become a, uh, you know, purveyor for a lot of these classic, um, you know, 16-bit, 8-bit titles. This is a, a place where you have your, your Stadia subscription and you can play all of this stuff. And, they, and he said, I think some of those older games would be harder for us to do <laughs> because they were all ran at 60 frames per second. There'd be a lot right. more latency. Well, uh, also, the, uh, the way the image is drawn, like pixel art, there's sharp pixels like that. Like that stuff's not great for compression necessarily. Right. Totally. In the way they right. do and it. And the download on those things are they're tiny little files. So why yeah. would you want to why stream, would you stream them? it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I all think right, as but... far as an all digital future goes, my main concern, at least here in the U.S., because 
our ISPs that are kind of crappy here. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. We don't have a lot of speed and a lot of them have data caps. Yeah. And that doesn't do well for a downloading tons of games or even streaming them. Um, it's just not a good situation. So they're going to have to, you know, all these tech companies are going to have to get together and solve that issue before a digital only future even becomes a thing, I think. Um, Cause I don't want to be running into data caps. I used Comcast, AKA Xfinity and, um, they only give you one terabyte a month unless you pay like a whole bunch bunch more. So, yeah. Yeah. So they have to deal with that. So streaming for sure. Um, what about the, like a, a straight up Netflix model? Do you, do you think like, um, steam or some of the other purveyors out there should be adopting something like that? Nintendo, let's say. I mean, they can, I think others have tried like to do that with like retro games. Um, I, I think there Isn't was there one like who was game tap. To- was something like right that. Someone, like, yeah, yeah I can't that's right yeah i remember but someone yep. was trying to get it rolling um like john is just not a future i'm tremendously interested in especially at this point um but i yeah i can't i don't really have a great answer because i'm not really interested in digital only games but we'll see what happens so the the, right. the, Net, the netflix model though i gotta chime in i actually don't think it's a good fit for games at all yeah uh films you can finish a film in two hours or less usually it's mm-hmm. there is a fixed time commitment to get everything out of that film mm-hmm. games are not like that you know you spend a lot more time in in games and i actually think it would be detrimental to the experience of a lot of games if you're just like going in there and playing them all like you would a netflix kind of uh thing and it's just it just would create like people already complain a little bit about backlogs and you know that kind of stuff and like i feel like that would just like amplify it to the next level or i guess a better comparison is like i'm sure you guys have experienced this you get like a giant pack of roms and you're like sweet i have every game for the system and you put it in and you're just like well geez what do i play and you end up just <laughs> yeah. like, like 20 yeah, games right. <laughs> and you don't actually get into any of them yes uh, and it's like you don't really get the full enjoyment out of it. So like yeah. for me, like ROMs have just become a thing where it's like if I'm curious about a game that I want to get for an old console that I maybe even played, it's like let me sample that again. Oh yeah, that's that's that is cool. I'll, I'll grab a cart, and that's when I'll actually put the time into it. But uh, just having a huge list of games isn't always that appealing. Right. Well, let's. I think that you guys have a really interesting perspective here for collectors out there because I guess there's two, there's a couple categories of collectors or a few categories, but one of them is the people that just buy to own the things and never play them. But but um, I don't want to talk about that because that's a total different obsession that mm-hmm. that uh, mm-hmm. I don't know is always healthy. I think maybe financially it can't be healthy. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the people that um, uh, run into that kind of uh, you know hesitation on what to choose to play how do you kind of guide those folks in to kind of start collecting and uh uh get the most out of the retro type of experiences that exist out there let's start with you john so for me i found you know even when you have the physical item sometimes you run into the issue of like geez like what do i actually want to play yeah the thing is though is most of the times if you you've got to put in like once you get over like the 10 or 20 minute hump on something, it usually hooks you at least, you know, if it's a good game, of course, but that's kind of the thing is you have to break that mental block of like just sampling something and you really have to kind of dig in. And so I kind of go through my library like games I maybe haven't finished. I'll just pop it in and just kind of decide, okay, this is the game I'm going to try to beat. And then you end up getting sucked into it for like a week or something. And you've had a great time doing it. And not only did you have a great time reaching the end, maybe that one time, now you know the game pretty well. And if it plays really well, uh, like a lot of classic games do, it's something you will wind up revisiting and doing runs through. And you just you just get that feel of playing it that's a lot of fun. So it's like you really got to stick with it because there is this mental barrier. Like if you're just going to play for five or ten minutes and it's a game you don't know you kind of just treat it as like this sampler plate and you're not really giving it the time it deserves. You really got to commit more to that. So don't, you, you can't give into that feeling of, oh, let me just see what this is. That's all right. I'll go on to the next one. You've really got to sit down, keep going and let it get it, let it get its hooks into you. I think to enjoy it the most. That's awesome. Is that um, something that you apply, uh, you know, strictly from the, 
perspective of wanting to create content possibly out of it or is it just for fun no, no, just just no. just to get something out of it that's that's how i that's how i like to play games uh, a lot cuz you know uh, i have a huge range of games and a lot of them i'd played off and on uh and some of them i've played a lot when i was younger and i still play today and it's kind of that mix but like the stuff like you know, this year I was like, you know what? I never beat um, uh, Batman: Return of the Joker on NES. Yeah, it's super hard that game. But I was like, I'm gonna finish that game this year, and I spent the time and just sat down and just learned the game and blasted through it, and it's awesome. And now yeah. I know it well enough where I can just jump in and play it again. And uh, that's awesome. It's like added to the roster of okay, this is a fun game to play when I when I just want something, you know, to go and or it's like classics that i used to play a lot when i was young like contra 3 the alien wars like i i know that game like the back of my hand now and it's just it's so fun to just pop in do a, a full playthrough and then you're done and just it's a cool experience and it keeps you kind of on your toes and uh you know revisiting stuff like that is awesome right on joe how do you approach all of all of that stuff collecting but um uh... I guess being judicious on what you spend your time with and finding a path through all of this to, you know, obviously create work for people, but also to have real fun and enjoyment for yourself. Yeah, it's, I mean, similar to what John said, you got to get over that hump of sampling games. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, creating the show, I'm playing a lot of games and that's mainly the time I put in to a lot of these games now. Yes. I just... I just sit down with them and I just try to get as far as I can into them. Um, don't always succeed with every game, but yeah. it's it's it can be tough with some games because I know once you get better at a game, you, once you spend so much time with it that you like like John said, no, like the back of your hand, you're gonna appreciate it more no matter what game it is, even if it's a crappy game, you're probably gonna appreciate it if you if you're really good at it. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to get really, really good with every single game I review on the show. Yeah. But if it's, uh, you know, even back before I started the show, it's like I would kind of have that same sampling mentality where, you know, I'd, I'd buy a game at a thrift store and then I'd come home, make sure it works, see the title screen, play it for two minutes and turn it off and it's still on my shelf, haven't touched it since. And, yeah. and it's just, I don't know. It's, it's definitely something you have to get over. That's the nature of collecting, and I think we all have that, you know. And I, and that's why it was so good for me to create a specific kind of segment with this side-scrolling thing, the side-scrolling superheroes. Uh, it forced me to like play these things through, and it gave me like a real line, which I really appreciated. Um, now, clearly, there are very expensive machines out there, like Turbo Graphics, in terms of p picking up the library or Neo Geo CD. Um, is but is there a platform that you would suggest for people that are kind of wanting to dig into some retro stuff and maybe start collecting that is maybe a little bit more affordable and they'll find some real gems as part of that collection? Honestly, nowadays, like the the real cheap games are like on the Wii um, and uh, maybe mm -hmm. PlayStation, PlayStation Three, two. Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. Yeah, um, oh, PlayStation Two, some of them. Um, yeah, yeah. So I would recommend that. You know, Genesis has always been cheaper than the Super Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Unless you're um, collecting Japanese Mega Drive games like I foolishly do, and then it gets really expensive. Yeah, it, it can still get really expensive even for the U.S. stuff. That's so true. That's true. It, it's hard to recommend, you know, something cheap, but I can only recommend what I know and like. So I usually yeah. recommend, you know, like the, the tried and true ones like Castle of Illusion and, and stuff like that on the Genesis yeah, yeah, and Act Razor on the a Super classic. Nintendo. Oh my God, Castle of Illusion, a classic. Yeah. What about yeah, you, yeah. John? Yeah, so for those types of systems, it's right. A lot of the well-known stuff like that, that that's still great and holds up is actually quite affordable, I would say. So if you want to get into that, you know, just look at some of the classics that maybe sold pretty well and you can usually get copies there. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Sonic still. Uh, all the Sonic games are quite cheap except for like, you know, Knuckles Chaotix, I guess, on 32X. But it's not the best one to play anyway. Uh, yeah. So you can you can kind of jump in there. Uh, a fun system to collect for that's pretty cheap, really, is still PlayStation 1, especially if you get into like Japanese games. And there's a lot of interesting ones. Like the prices on those are pretty low still. 
and it's fun because you know you, you, there's a lot of unique games that maybe didn't come out in the u.s and they have interesting cover designs and play mechanics and uh, you can really discover some gems that way i mean obviously there's plenty of expensive stuff on playstation as well but it's not like with saturn or, or genesis slash mega drive or super nes like the prices on that stuff on a lot of that stuff it, it's just it's gone so far up uh, or even like less no, less known systems those are tough like the jaguar like the atari jaguar the games for that are stupidly expensive usually um you know i guess 3do is not too bad but i <laughs> the library is not that great either though is there a holy grail game that you guys are still kind of chasing after is there something that you really want that you don't have uh yeah I could say one. Uh, I do want to get a proper copy of uh, Battle Mania Daiginjo for Mega Drive, but that's like kind of that's pretty much a thousand dollar game on average. What? So oh it's my kind god! Of like a little bit out of my reach. Like I have most of the other <laughs> Grails for the system. Some I've had for a while. Some I've got recently from from other folks. And uh, but that one that one continues to elude me and it's a very good Victokai shooter that really pushes the system hard. I've played it plenty and I even have like a it's the only game I have a repro for, but I ended up not using it because repros like that are very poorly made, so mm-hmm. don't recommend it. Um, yeah. but I really want to get a legit copy of that someday. What about you, Joe? Uh I hate to say this because it's not a good game. But Buster Douglas knockout boxing on the Master System because that's the only game I'm missing from the U.S. collection, and it's stupid expensive. It's ridiculous. Wow, you you have a complete, how much almost complete collection except for that one? Oh wow, wow. that's awesome though. Well, how, how how much is the game going for? Uh, the last time I saw it on eBay was over five hundred dollars, <laughs> but oh, I'm my sure god. it's more than that now. Oh it's my ridiculous. god! I don't know oh. why this game would be that expensive. That is nuts. It's, that's like, um, what is it? There's a, there's the baseball game for 32x. That's stupid expensive. The RBI uh, or the World Series? I don't World know. Series. It's World Series. Okay. I think it's the, it's one I of the might last. I have that games. one. That one's I pretty might expensive. Have that one. yeah. There's also that that canceled NBA game uh, on PS3 and 360. Oh, uh, NBA EA. Live. No, no, no. There was this one that was like got canceled by EA. It was actually yeah, put in live stores. 11. Was it live? I thought it was like something else. It's like uh, NBA well, have, Elite. NBA Elite. Oh yeah, NBA Elite. I have that. Yes, they you, sent you me have the a re- copy of that. They, okay. they sent me the review code of it, but I don't have like a, ah, a store copy of yeah, it. Yeah, the store copies for that. I mean, those are like ten grand or something. <laughs> what? Oh my god. Oh, oh, they're on the upper end. I'll never have a complete Japanese Mega Drive collection, but a friend of mine uh, actually got well, somebody I know actually got a final game. It's Tetris. Have you guys seen Tetris the Japanese version of that, Victor? Um, or Mega I, Drive. Isn't it, it's on the Sega Genesis Mini. It is, and yes, uh, they really it's want not to put good. It there. It's it's an interesting version. It's a conversion of the yeah. Sega arcade game, but because of licensing issues back in the day, the game got pulled pretty quickly in Japan, and real copies of it go for like thirty, forty grand. So holy crap! Not That's gonna get insane. that one. <laughs> <laughs> That is incredible! Oh my God, that that is crazy. Um, okay, well let's uh, let's let and end the the convo with something that you guys are looking forward to. This was a brutal year, and you know, video games. I've been saying this, and it really kind of hit me in the last few weeks. Just how much they uh, were a lifesaver. They kept us home and they kept us entertained. Uh, but 2021 is around the corner. Some good news coming, um, but lots of games are coming as well. And I'm wondering if you have a, a game that you're most looking forward to in 2021. It can be retro as well, but I'm just uh, I'm I'm curious. John, we'll start with you. Oh geez, um, 2021. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff on the way. Um, I don't even know if it's probably not going to hit 2021, but I continue to have hope and excitement for Metroid Prime Four. It's not yes. it's not pushing the tech or anything necessarily. It's still a Switch game, but I love that original so much. Uh, I've been waiting for another installment in that for a long time, uh, and I I just want to see it. So I really hope that we get that at some point. Awesome, me too, Joe. Well, I'm looking to, forward to seeing the PS5 and the Xbox Series X evolve, but 
like John said, Metroid Prime 4 would be pretty <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I'm also looking forward to the new F Zero, which hasn't been announced yet. Which oh. they do. Jeez. Yeah. Come on. Yes. <laughs> do you do you think Nintendo needs to drop a, a new Switch on us next year, or can they wait another year? They Stop. got it. They got to do the Switch Pro or whatever it's going to be. I yeah. Mean, yeah. We know something's in the works. Obviously, there's the rumors everywhere. Um, the thing is, is it's like. You know the switch is still pretty cool for a handheld device it's doing a lot there it was scraping by with uh ps4 and xbox one games being ported over even though the original stuff is what's strongest on there but mm -hmm. uh, with the next generation hitting i feel like if they want to keep other publishers happy and bring in games over and maybe this still won't work because if the switch pro is just like a ps4 pro uh then you still got to support that original switch so i don't know how it's going to work out but yeah Finding some way to improve the look of Switch games and the performance of Switch games, especially if you're playing docked on a 4K screen. Because Switch does not look very good on yeah. a 4K screen, I think. Uh, I think that's a, that would be a nice thing. Joe, you, you agree with that? Yeah, I do. Um, I haven't been really paying attention to the Switch Pro announcements. I mean, I will when they, once they actually announce the yeah, thing. Yeah, once it's really announced. Yeah. But, yeah. Boy, I, I hope they at least come out with some uh, 4K HDR support because mm -hmm. they really need at least HDR. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Doom Eternal is uh, is brand new this week on the Switch. I don't know if you've taken a look at that yet, John, but it's... I have. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's... On it. um, you know, the thing about these ports, is this actually gets into like the retro stuff almost where the Switch has no business running a game like that. Yeah. But they did it. And the yeah. cutbacks are extremely clear, right? Like yes. it is, it does not look anywhere near as good as the other versions, but it's still the game. It looks good enough. And I just think it's really fascinating to see the cuts that they did make to actually make that work. I, I'm going to wrap up the, uh, the podcast there. Uh, and I want to thank you guys so much for being a part of this. This was uh, John Linneman and Joe Redifer. You have to check out their stuff uh, at Digital Foundry on YouTube or GameSack on YouTube. Check, out, check them both out. They're both incredible channels, and these guys make exceptional work. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, I hope to have you back again in 2021 and uh, have an awesome holiday season. Thank you all for watching. We will see you soon. And until then, play forever. Play forever.